Hello, everyone, and welcome to Real Vision Live. For Real Vision, I'm Max Sweethy. I'm joined today by Paul Hodges, author of The PH Report, and also, I believe, Paul, you've just changed the name of your business to The New Normal Consulting. Indeed, Max. Yes, we we luckily own the uh, website new-normal.com, and New Normal seems to be the place to be these days, doesn't it? Yeah, I think that's a great place for us to start. We've had you on really right as you were making that change, and I'm sure it's been uh, a, a big, exciting time for you guys as your your sort of bet on things not going back to normal as as or quote unquote normal as quickly as we all had hoped uh, seems to have been coming to fruition. And and you're still doing the pH report, but you've launched a a new newsletter uh, that's going out weekly. Can we just talk a little bit about how your business has changed? Yes, I mean we, we we've had a you know, established consulting business for many years now. We've produced the report. Um, what we've seen is that there's an enormous amount of change underway with uncertain destinations. I mean, when I was on uh, in May, for example, uh, my main point was that you know, most people were expecting a V-shaped recovery, but that the evidence we had from the chemical industry was that that wasn't going to happen. This wasn't going to be the same as 2008, 2009. Uh, this was going to be something quite different. And the what we've seen over the sort of few months since then is that what the pandemic is doing is accelerating some major paradigm shifts in the marketplace, which were underway, if you like. But it's like a sort of we talk about S-shaped curves, where you go along the bottom, and actually, you know, nothing much appears to happen, and people go, oh, "What a waste of time that was!" Never thought, it would, never thought, it would. and then, oh, wait a minute, did you see that happen? Uh, we were talking about cars with somebody in Italy uh, in the summer. And they said, oh, well, the, the deputy mayor of Milan has just said exactly that, that things we were talking about for 2030, we're going to be doing in 2020. There's this acceleration that's going underway with the pa- pandemic. Okay. Yeah. And so I, I got to, to look at your October 2020 edition of the PH report, which is really going to inform our, our conversation today. Um, but you are going to be giving our Real Vision viewers some pieces of this. So can you talk to us a little bit about what the PH report is and, and what we've agreed to uh, in terms of the autos report coming every quarter for our Real Vision subscribers? Yes, I mean, you know, we, we really like working with you, and uh, th- thank, thank you for uh, for your support. So, what we've done is we've developed a, a new weekly uh, called New Normal Insight, which uh, is a shorter form uh, report uh, covering the, th- the major markets. So, it covers the oil markets, the stock market, you know, interest rates, and usually one other topic. And we're producing that every week, and we're offering that. Uh, free for uh, three months to uh, Real Vision uh, subscribers. And then, as you say, uh, every quarter in the PH report, we talk about the auto market globally in some depth. A lot of change is happening there. And uh, so you've kind of twisted our arms and we said, OK, right, we'll, we'll happily give you that section of the report as well. So I, I hope people uh, find that valuable. Well, thank you very much for that, Paul, and I, and I hope there wasn't too much arm twisting on my end. But uh, with all that being said, thank you for for doing this partnership. And I just wanted to to let viewers know what all is happening here um, in terms of of us working together. But why don't we jump right in? You you've provided a slide. Sorry for interrupting your video, but I have an important message to share. At Real Vision, we pride ourselves on providing the very best in-depth expert analysis available to help you understand the complex world of finance, business, and the global economy. So if you like what you see on Real Vision's YouTube channel, that is just the tip of an iceberg. You should come over to realvision.com and see how we are not leaving any stone unturned from publishing more in-depth videos, live discussions, written reports, and our latest feature, The Exchange, where you get a chance to engage with experts and fellow subscribers and learn from everyone's experience. It is an experience which you live and you learn from. So if you go to the link in the description or go to realvision.com, it costs you just $1. I don't think you can afford to be without it. Thank 
you for for doing this partnership. I just wanted to to let viewers know what all is happening here um, in terms of of us working together. But why don't we jump right in? You you've provided a slide deck. Um, why don't we get the the first couple slides pulled up here, and and we can jump right into to what you're seeing as as the new normal is unfolding. Right. So essentially, one way of looking at this uh, is with um, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, uh, who was a Swiss-American uh, psychiatrist, who looked at how, originally, how people react to death, uh, because people don't just react and, and sort of become very sad. They actually go through, as she noted, various phases before things come back. So first of all, you sort of say, look, I can't believe great Uncle George is dead. I saw him yesterday. He was looking wonderful. Then it sinks in, and you begin to get very angry. And you say, I can't believe great Uncle George, he didn't smoke. He was, he was a wonderful man. He had fantastic things in the community, and he's dead. And that couple down the road, and we make all that noise and have all the drugs and so on. It's not, oh, it's horrible. And and, and so you go through these, these stages. And what I suggest, it's a very well-known, very well-tested uh, uh, sequence and what I suggest is that we're now, we're now going we've gone through the denial um, you know, governments have, have recognized that actually this COVID pandemic is really serious and isn't going to go away there isn't going to be a vaccine in five minutes and we all so on uh, populations you know are starting to realize they have to change behavior and and there's anger and um, and every, everybody blames everybody else and we'll go through bargaining uh, then I'm afraid we'll probably get to depression uh, what we've lost, and then, and this is this is the important bit. Out of that depression comes an acceptance of what's happened, and new opportunities emerge. And that's really what we're trying to focus on here. That if we look out, not over the next five minutes or the next, you know, sort of Fed meeting or whatever. If we look out, you, know, you want to be a genuine investor. What are the things that you can look at in the way of paradigm shifts that will actually uh, not only preserve your, uh, your your capital, but actually grow it? Yeah. And, and you start out your report really with not a major paradigm shift that was unpredicted, but maybe something that has been accelerated by the trend. And that's that's the demographic trends that are really the big driving forces underneath it all. Um, looking at demographics, what is it that you see happening? And not not a big you know left turn here caused by the pandemic, but uh, we're starting to see these things coming through a little bit faster. Exactly. I, I thought. I think there's the, the thing about demographics is you kind of know where you are, um, so that um, if you if you think about where we've been over the last sort of 50, 60 years, nineteen fifty, a bit before uh, you, you you and I were born. Uh, the population of the world uh, was was around two two and a half billion, and as you can see there, uh, most of them were young. It, you know, when it's called the baby boom generation, it was the baby boom generation. Um, then we've got wealth creators at twenty five to fifty four age group, and we'll come back to that um, in in a moment. But there were you know quite a lot of adults who were having these these kids, but there was virtually no people over the age of fifty five. Um, you got to uh, 60 if you were lucky, or 65. Uh, you got your gold watch when you retired. Maybe you had a year on the golf course and you died. Now, the, uh, you know, what we've seen over this period is two fundamental changes in behavior uh, and lifespan. So first is that from 1970, in the West, across the States, across Europe uh, and, and, and elsewhere, women stopped having enough babies to replace the population. So 2.1 babies. So after 1970, we haven't been replacing either the US or the Western population. Second point is, therefore, the number of babies is going down. And eventually, that means if you don't have babies, they don't grow up to become wealth creators. Equally, we've had this wonderful uh, development of increased life expectancy, so that instead of dying at around pension age, you're now likely to live to at least 80, maybe even 85, or on average, depending on where you live. So we're suddenly now getting, and I say suddenly, because it's taken 60 or 70 years to get there, but we're suddenly, if you look forward over the next 10 years, in the world, in the West, 
in the States, the majority of population increase is going to be in that perennials group. You can see the numbers there. Uh, you know, look in, in the states, uh, in, in, in the West rather, as a, as a specific example. So the number of perennials is going to go up from 415 million to 458. The number of wealth creators is going to go down. And the number of under 25s is about the same. Now, people talk about the US being different demographics from Europe. It isn't. They just haven't looked. And so the key takeaway is that when we talk about population growth over the next 10 years, what we are actually talking about is increased life expectancy. And that completely changes the economic environment. And I can sort of show you, you know, what that means in terms of US demand, for example, because this is very important. Why, are we, why do we call people wealth creators? Why do we call them perennials? Well, because the, the wealth creators are, you, you go to school, you go to college, you can do an apprenticeship, you go to university, whatever it is, and then you get into your job and you, or you often settle down, you may want to have kids, you can move along in your career, you earn more money, you set up home and so on, and it may be more delayed or whatever. But as you can see, from the age of 25 onwards, under 25, you're basically reliant on your parents, more or less, um, your, your spending goes up. And this is important because consumer spending is 70% of the US economy. And it's a similar number across the West. So in other words, what I'm showing you here is what drives the economy. Now, if you've got lots and lots and lots and lots and you know hundreds of millions and billions of wealth creators in that 25 to 54 age group, you have lots and lots and lots and lots of demand. You don't need a central bank for that. The central bank's irrelevant. You have to get, you know, if the world goes from two and a half billion people to seven and a half billion people over 70 years, treble the world population, you're going to get quite a lot of new demand. But look what happens after the age of 55. People aren't dying now and their spend goes down. No, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing, you know, this isn't an argument for euthanasia at the age of 55 or anything like that. You know, perennials are very nice people. They've got a lot to contribute and everything else. But they aren't going to be buying all the things that they bought when they were younger. They're not having kids. They're starting to retire. So the, the whole kind of the flow of the economy completely changes. And you know, what's also important, we, you know, we, can, we can compare and contrast, if you like, between you know, over the last 20 years, because this, this trend has been accelerating over the last 20 years since 2000. And we can look at, well, thank you, you, know, you can look at how this change, this has changed. So if you go back, you know, the, light, the, the lighter blue numbers are year 2000, and the lighter orange numbers are the year 2000. And what you can see is that over the last 20 years, we've got 23 million more perennials in the US of A than we had 20 years ago. And those perennials are spending 12K less than if they were wealth creators on average. So you've got a lot more of them and they're spending less. And that trend is going to continue because obviously what we've got today in the uh, uh, in the perennials, those are the the older wealth creators, if you like, or the younger perennials. As the more of the baby boomers move into the perennials, so the older perennials, the ones who were born in 46, 50, 90, and so on, 1955, they get older and they spend less, as we just saw on the previous slide. So, and this is just you know, anyone can look at this. This is Bureau of Labor Statistics. Uh, data was published, very new data actually, for this year, published uh, two or three weeks ago. But the trend is there all the time. So uh, we, we know what's going to happen in the economy here. We know, what, and, and so it's no point in saying we're going to go back to an old normal, normal because we haven't got that growth in the wealth creators anymore. We've now got growth in the perennials, which I yeah, say that's, is, yeah, that's, that's the part of this chart. It's not really that that gap between the 55-year-olds between 2000 and 2020, it's the gap 
or the the really the lack of a gap between the 25 to to 54 year olds. It's the 65 million only going up to 66, mm. whereas the spend has only gone up 5k. Maybe if they were spending 150k, we could make up the difference if all of the people my age had gotten uh, nice and rich. But it doesn't seem to have been that way. Now you obviously need to have a word with Raul. I'll I'll help you on that one. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, that's what we need. But I I guess the question then is is We've talked about this being a problem in the U.S., but is it a problem everywhere? Are there any pockets of hope out there that uh, that have the right demographics to to keep the growth, um, sort of the old growth narrative going? Well, I mean, let's look at the the sort of G twenty, which is sort of seventy five or eighty percent of the uh, of the of the global global economy, and essentially it divides up into three three groups. So you've got on the top right-hand corner, you've got rich but old. So the states, uh, UK, most of Europe is there, South Korea is there, uh, Japan is there, uh, and so on. So they're you know they're in the sort of median age of forty to forty-five, maybe going up to forty-seven or so. But they're earning you know got, got quite a lot of money. It's just their their needs are now different. Then on the other hand, you've got the the, the younger. Uh, people where you would hope to have, if we've got a demographic deficit and an economic deficit in the rich but old group, uh, in the poor but young, we've got a we've got a demographic dividend. But the problem is they are very poor. You know, people have talked about they spread this myth of you know China becoming middle class, and I go look, excuse me, but actually you know, China, China's average income is less than the poverty level in the states. It's less than the poverty level. And if you go out of the of the cities into the rural half of the country, which is still 600 million people, so larger than the states, it's a lot less than uh, poverty. You know, it's just a few, three or four thousand dollars of disposable income a year. So um, it, it, you, can't, you can't just switch from one to the other, as people have sort of rather, uh, you know, sort of naively sort of suggested. Um, and, and what you can see, you know, if you, if you look at those countries, what you can actually see is that most of them are now in some kind of, sort of social turmoil. Um, Argentina, Mexico, Turkey, Brazil, and so on. Um, they're suffering because they're not getting a lot of their income was remittances from the rich countries, and they're not getting those remittances anymore. And of course, trade is reduced, and so on. And then you have a third group uh, there on the bottom right-hand corner, which is Russia and China, and they have, you know, their, their demographics are pretty bad, um, and they're also poor. So, you know, the question for both of them is: is will they get? Well, used to be, will they get rich? before they get old. We know the answer to that, no, they won't get rich. But can they actually afford to be old? Can they put in place for the first time proper social security? Can they put in place proper health services and so on? These kind of basic needs. So what I'm what I'm suggesting is A, that we're not going to go back to where we were because we haven't got all those Western baby boomers, the richest and largest generation in history. But we have got a number of new demographic cohorts coming through, which are going to be a goldmine, frankly, for the companies that actually focus on them. So it sounds like the opportunity is in that poor and young uh, sector, or are you saying there's opportunity really in all three of these different bubbles, um, but it's not going to be as easy as, as throwing a dart at the wall as it might have been from uh, 1983? I know that you... Um, in your report, you know, you, you quoted Bill Clinton, it's the economy, stupid. Um, but it, it's not the economy anymore. Uh, there, there are, you're going to have to actually figure out what the trends are. Uh, you can't just ride that baby boomer wave of growth. You put it very well, I think, Max. Thank you. Because exactly what we're saying here is that this is one of the key paradigm shifts, really, that's going on now and is being accelerated, as I said, by the pandemic, which is that the we're moving away from a focus on supply. You know, if you remember, globalization was all about getting more supply. Why did we need more supply? Because we had more and more wealth creators who needed more and more stuff. Now we don't need more and more stuff, so globalization becomes unnecessary, really. We need to do more with less, which is why sustainability comes in to replace uh, globalization. And crucially, 
instead of sort of looking over our shoulder and well, where's the supply coming from, we now have to go back and focus on where demand is coming from. And so we're really going to start looking at demand uh, now. And that you're, this is why you're exactly right, that we need to think about what are the particular segments. And the chemical industry uh, is, is a really good uh, leading indicator for all of this. It tells us what we need to do um, if we just follow the, uh, f- follow the data. Yeah, and that's that's where I wanted to go next is is really those first two charts in the chart book that you put out. Um, the first chart is is this one of capacity utilization, which shows the sort of the the slowdown of this demographic tailwind that that demand is just not going to reach those levels that we saw before. Um, and then the next one, which is the segmentation that you were talking mm-hmm. about. So. Firstly, let's let's start with uh, page number three and, and this chart of capacity u- utilization. Yeah. Well, what we know is that the chemical industry, and I've talked about this, I think, every time that I've been on uh, R- R- Real Vision, so I'll, I'll bore on and go out again. Chemical industry is the third largest industry in the world. It goes into every application. Everything in the room that you're sitting in has got chemicals in it in one shape or form. Fibers, plastics, you name it, it's got it. Uh, even adhesives and so on, washing powder, etc. And similarly, it goes into every country. So we get early warning of what's happening. And what you can see exactly as you said there, Max, is that the the industry peak demand peaked on terms of capacity utilization back you know three three years ago, and we started to come down. We started to come down, and then in December we started to fall off the cliff. So you know when people go on about oh it's the pandemic, so it wasn't the pandemic. It had already happened, but the pandemic certainly accelerated it, and now we've come back a bit, obviously. You know, if you lock people up for three months, things break. They need to re- be re- replaced. Uh, they've got some money in their pockets. They want to go and spend it. They want to, and so on. You know, we know all those stories. You don't need to go into that. Um, so yes, it's coming back, but it's not going anywhere near back to that 87 percent. You know, we may well get back to 82 percent, perhaps looking perhaps less likely at the moment. Uh, but you know, we, we've reached seventy nine percent in August compared to eighty seven percent. Uh, capacity utilization you know, three years ago. So we're, you know, we're well down here. And then if we look at the individual regions and, uh, and, and sectors, you know, this is fascinating. This is, I think, a really good guide for, for investors because w- w- what it's saying is that you know, every, every region is now operating in a different way. And these things will change around. You know, the oil price has been quite strong over the last few months. Therefore, it's not surprising that the former Soviet Union and the Middle East are doing well. China obviously has come out of the uh, uh, the, the lockdowns earlier. So again, it's doing better. Western Europe, again, is coming out, you know, Asia Pacific and so on. So you can, you can look at these, but of course they will change. You know, if we, if we come back and talk about this in three or six months' time, I'll guarantee you that that order of regions will have changed. Similarly, if we, if we look at the major sectors, what's interesting is that plastics has done very well. Now, you know, I, I love plastic. I think they're an incredibly useful product. But if you'd asked most people nine months ago, oh, they hated plastic. They didn't want plastics. They were nasty pollution and so on. Well, actually, we discover that plastics can help you stay healthy and help to avoid transmission of the virus. So plastics are suddenly very popular. <laughs> Similarly, fibers, uh, PPE. You know, that's that's what fibers is. So, um, so that that demand trend changes, and the consumer is obviously coming back. But look over at coatings. Coatings is at an all-time low, and in two thousand and nine, as you may remember from May, Max, you know, when we talked, the thing about the two thousand and eight crisis was it was a subprime crisis, so it was housing and autos that collapsed. And then the Fed came in, threw all the money at it, and suddenly coatings took off again because house sales and uh, and auto sales took off. It's not happening this time, and it, and it, it's really interesting. If you if you're a momentum based investor, these aren't going to be terribly good markets for you. But if you're actually interested in understanding what's happening in each of these sectors and regions and putting some work in, you're going to get, I think, a very good reward. So. Could plastics and some of those those categories that are doing well also be that that consumer demand that we've seen kind of stubbornly keep its head up? Uh, you talked about the need for everybody's buying food like crazy and the plastic packaging that goes around that. What makes up that 
plastics, I mean, it's not all PPE. Uh, like what, what exactly makes up the, the plastics um, category? Well, pl- plastics, about, about half of, uh, of, of, we talk about polyethylene and polypropylene as the biggest uh, plastics, about half of polyethylene and about a quarter of polypropylene goes into consumer packaging. So it's the film that wraps up uh, food. It's the uh, the plastic that it's all wrapped in. It's the the bags that you take home and and so on. Uh, then there's obviously a lot of lot of plastic used around the home, around the offices, uh, around or autos and and so on. Um, and and they're obviously uh, more that's more consumer durable kind of spending. So you've got the the immediate consumer discretionary spending. Uh, sorry, you, you've got the you, you've got the consumer discretionary spending. Where if I've got some money, I might go and buy a new car. But if if I haven't, I won't uh, unless I really have to. And then there's the day to day spending by consumers, uh, where up till now, uh, plastics has has actually done quite well. Okay. Well, uh, we also have some. You had some other charts actually in the back of the deck on mm. poly, polyethylene. Um, since we brought that up, why don't we go there? We can finish up the chart deck and then get into some questions from the audience. Right. Um, so let's see here. We'll, we'll go through polyethylene. Yes. We're, we're kind of skipping around here, um, yes. but let's 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 jump right in. Yeah. Now the, 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 this is this is a, this is a great warning uh, sign. So there's some good things going on and there's some, some bad things. One of the great problems, everybody got terribly excited about shale. And shale is fine if you are supply driven. If I'm always looking over my shoulder, wanting to get more supply. But if I don't need more supply, because actually the wealth creators, a number of them, is, is going down, then I don't need more uh, polyethylene and so on. And we've always known that the USA plastic market itself for polyethylene was flat. But you know, the gamble was four or five years ago, oil will always be $100, globalization will continue, China will grow at double digit rates, and no need to worry about sustainability, um, you know, every, everything will be fine. But you know, if we actually look at where we are today, and what's happening on the trade data, those US plants are now, I'm afraid, in, in trouble. Uh, because they've expanded capacity uh, on the on the basis, uh, if we if we look at the US, that's it, yeah, you know, the US trade data there. Um, you know, most of this was supposed to go to China. Well, hang on a moment. It's you know, US exports have gone up twenty five percent over three over three years, but it doesn't sound bad. But it's uh, it's one hundred and fifteen thousand tons. Uh, it's not the millions of tons uh, that is, that's been expanded, and. So if you, if you look at what's happened, if there's a lot of new capacity there on the basis that it was all supposed to go to China and the markets and so on, globalization and so on, which hasn't happened. And if you look now at, at China, it's going to get worse because China is now pursuing self-sufficiency. As a result of the president's trade policies, China no longer sees the states as a reliable policy. A, a reliable partner. What it used to say was, look, there's going to be bumps in the road. Obviously, we're going to disagree. But in the end, the relationship between the two biggest economies in the world, you know, we're going to manage to rub along. China doesn't believe that anymore. It doesn't believe that, you know, even if Biden gets elected, that we're going back to that. So China is now looking at self-sufficiency. And it's going to put in, let's say, to nearly two and a half million tons just in the second half of this year. We'll probably put in up to 10 million tons by the end of 2022. So most of its imports from the rest of Asia, the Middle East, and a little bit from, from the States and Canada will disappear. So you've now got a lot of producers of polyethylene in the Middle East, in uh, in Asia, and in the States, all fighting over a market won't exist anymore because China will prioritize its own its own demand. And, and this is the great case study, if you like, for investors. That we've all believed that if you build it, they will come. You know, if you remember that famous uh, baseball movie, Field of Dreams, you know, if you build it, they will come. That's what we have to do in chemicals. That's what we have to do in every every industry. We just build it and it will come. Not going to be like that in future. And the chemical industry is showing us in advance why that's not why that's not true. But also uh, opening up the new opportunities. 
Yeah, so that that's really interesting because this um, supply chains coming home uh, story has really been talked about from the perspective of the West, and people really haven't focused on how the that same thing is happening uh, in China too. Now you said that they are they are poor in an aging uh, country. Is this something that is uh, it's good for their self sufficiency, but it's probably going to hurt them? I, you know, you could argue that that's what the shale oil uh, boom was all about was about us reaching energy independence. But look at it now. You know, we're seeing bankruptcies left and right, uh, and and it's looking like that was really a folly. Is this one of those scenarios, or is this something that that they're going to be able to do and do it sustainably at a profit, uh, or is it really just just to to be self sufficient for self sufficiency's sake? Well, you you, you mentioned our, our October report and and the difference with Bill Clinton. And this, of course, is why Hillary Clinton lost in uh, 2016 and why it looks like President Trump is going to lose uh, this time, whether or not he accepts it's another question. And the, the issue is that we're no longer in a world where economics is the answer. It's not the economy anymore. We're going back to a world where politics and social issues matter as much or even more than, uh, than economic issues. People are prepared to cut off their nose to spite their face, if you like, because, you know, so what I'd argue is that people who set up businesses on the basis of exporting are now going to be really exposed. They are, in fact, already exposed. If you're setting it up on the basis of domestic demand, well, you will have dark demand. Whether you can make any money out of it is another question. You know, so it, as I say, it does get more complicated for investors. You can't just wait around for the Fed to put some more stimulus money in and see what happens. Uh, you do actually have to go back to doing some hard homework, I'm afraid. <laughs> Well, there is uh, in, in the final slide that you have for us. There is one industry that you see as this type of opportunity that captures a trend that we're seeing. Um, can you talk a little bit about recycling? I, you know, personally, I've always been uh, a recycling skeptic on its one, its cost effectiveness, and its whether it actually is green. Um, I, I saw something the other day that was like most of the commercials you ever saw about recycling actually came from the plastic industry as a way to to convince you that that it was that you weren't just throwing it into the landfill. So it, I'd actually be interested to know whether one is that true? It does recycling work? And then and then two, what your thoughts are on on the future of recycling? Well, thanks, Max. I mean, I did a an industry webinar in uh, New York. Of, if if one can do a virtual webinar somewhere, but it was anyway, it was a it was a New York group, and uh, you know, I worked in the states, I worked in Houston, and so on. So I sort of took my courage in both hands and said, "Look, I really don't know why we're we're drilling in the Permian Basin and uh, and el elsewhere. We don't need to drill. What we need to do, you know, in New York, is to go out to Long Island to the waste sites where we've got you know millions of pounds of." of hydrocarbons, millions of pounds of, of plastics, and we know it's there, so there's absolutely no risk, and we need to start getting it out and making use of it with recycling. We also we need to need to make much better use, we need to have much better collection mechanisms within New York itself and every other city. We don't have proper collection at the moment. But you know it, it is if if you put it the other way around, that you're paying 40 bucks a barrel for oil, you're paying more for refining, for logistics and so on. So why? So you can walk down to the shop or you can drive down to the shop, you take some, uh, you buy some product, they put it in a plastic bag, you take the plastic ho bag home and you throw it away. I mean, this is a colossal waste of money, you know, but the fact that it's, it's one bag that you throw away or five bags or something. But what's interesting is that a lot of people have been doing more online um, uh, shopping, obviously in the last few months. And I've talked to literally hundreds of people who've all said, I never realized how many plastic bags were involved. Maybe take one at a time or two at a time, you don't think about it. So we've got an opportunity, not only would you like to save the planet, which is you know a nice thing to do, but actually, commercially, this is a really good idea. It's very much cheaper to go after the plastic that we know is already there and to reuse it rather than to the risk of drilling and all the other things that go along with it. So what could you produce a barrel of oil from 
for? Or at what price could you produce a barrel of oil from recycled plastics? Or I, you know, would, the, the I, equivalent, I would, I equivalent yeah. end equivalent end products. Well, I wouldn't take it back to. Um, I wouldn't take it down to oil. I just what I do is let that little plant there, which we cooked up with uh, with our friends at the New Plastics Economy, um, and McKinsey. Um, what I'd say is you, you put in a chemical recycling plant there and then you, you, you make it into polymer, you put a 3D printer there and then you, you sell the product back. So you create jobs as well. But if we could um, switch back a couple of slides and just look at the energy market one for a moment, Max. Um, that one. What, what I'd say is, of course, today, at the very early days, costs are quite high. I'm not going to I'm not going to argue that. Costs are always high when you start out. But what I'd argue is that electricity costs, as you can see here, have come down massively over the last 10 years. So what I've done here is I've, I've plotted the forecast made by the most expert group in the world, the International Energy Agency, where they thought prices would be in 2035 and 2040. Right? And then look at where you actually are today. And you, what you see is that the experience curve works incredibly quickly. So if you're talking about, suppose you're talking about, you know, 100 bucks a barrel equivalent cost today, which you know, is, it would be too high, but just for the sake of numbers, you, you'll be you'll be down at somewhere like five or ten within ten years. So you 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 go incredibly quickly down these experience curves because once you start to do it, you know, you begin to say, well, you know, why aren't we doing that? Why aren't we doing this? Come on, you know, human beings are very creative. So there's inertia at the moment, but once we get into it, and that, of course, is why it's a big opportunity. You know, there are companies out there who are starting to float, and they've got some big, I mean, Agilix, um, for example, floated uh, in Norway, uh, and has a, a few weeks ago, uh, has a $200 million uh, valuation already. We've seen in the electricity field that there are uh, renewable um, energy companies now with a higher market cap than ExxonMobil. You wouldn't have thought that 10 years ago. So I'm pretty confident that this recycling thing is going to do the same sort of development. So I guess my assessment of where we are isn't that far off. It's just that the brain power hasn't been put into actually addressing this problem to get us where you might see you know, the, the sorts of trends we're seeing with solar. It, it's really just that the, the industry itself is so young, not that it's undoable. Exactly. Yeah. OK. All right. Well, uh, we got some questions from the audience. I think is a good time to, to transition over to, to that part of the segment. Mm -hmm. um, Daniel wants to know, you had spoken about the auto sector previously as having a certain amount of element of catch-up demand due to COVID-related lockdown factors. Uh, have you seen that come through? What is your outlook now? Um, and he also wants to know your outlook for refining margins in Europe. Right. Remind me if I, if I forget the second question. So, autos, thank you very much. Um, that, that's, a, that's a great question because, yes, indeed, we have seen the catch-up uh, volume. And it reminds me that the other thing I said was that I thought the really big move was going to be in used autos. And because you know what we were seeing back in May was that, obviously, factory production was being disrupted uh, because of COVID. Uh, factories were having to shut lines and so on and so forth. But that when people came out of lockdown, they would need uh, a car and you know their car had broken down or whatever. And so if there weren't going to be a lot of new cars there, then they would go and buy used cars. And the, the prices for, uh, for used cars have gone up exactly as we thought they would, uh, which is encouraging because it means that if you're focusing on demand, you can actually get a, a, a common sense kind of view on what is happening here. You know, if you ask your friends and neighbours what they're doing, they'll probably tell you, and then you can go, oh, wait a minute, that's what the market will be doing, you know, in most cases. In terms of refining margins, uh, I think the easiest way to reply to that, uh, Daniel may have seen the comment from, or the report from Shell. Uh, Shell had 55 refineries in 2005, so that's 15 years ago. They're down to 17 refineries today, and they say they're going to go to... 10. So they're going to cut another seven, um, you know, over, over a third of their refineries. And, and that's because the margins have collapsed. And if you look around 
I mean, the States is a bit backward on electric vehicles, but it, it will catch up, uh, no doubt about it. Uh, Europe and China are going flat out uh, for various reasons. And so you're already seeing in Europe 10% of the auto market this year is electric vehicles, 10%. And the minimum forecast that anybody's got for next year is 15%. So you're going to be up to 50% pretty quickly now because there's, you know, the, the electric vehicles are far more reliable. They've got far fewer moving parts. And so they're actually, once you've once you've got them down to a sensible price, uh, twenty, thirty thousand uh, dollars, they're actually much, much cheaper overall and affordable. So uh, refining margins, I think, what you can do is just look at what's happening to gasoline demand. Look at what's happening to jet fuel demand. It's really not going to do very well for the next few years. So refining margins are going to struggle. Okay. Now you talked about the U.S. kind of having it backwards on EVs. How much of that do you think has to do with the geography and the interconnectedness of you know sort of long distance travel uh, via car? It's it's hard to take an EV uh, driving you know between even you lived in Texas. Texas is larger than many European countries, and uh, I imagine getting across the state in electric vehicle, there might be a couple of routes that you can take that have the right charging stations, and you have to stop and. And, and charge your car up versus you know these other smaller countries and and even China you know the populations are very urban and I doubt there's very much uh, you know driving across the the countryside of China that's happening uh, it is a very uniquely American thing to 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 do the sort of cross country road trip but it is it is a big thing here do you think that that plays a factor into how long it's going to take for the U S to catch up with the rest of the world in terms of electric vehicles. I, I, I mean, I absolutely agree with you. When we were in, uh, in Houston, our neighbours uh, from Houston decided uh, over uh, in the uh, Independence uh, week weekend to uh, to drive to the Grand Canyon and back, which seemed to us Europeans like completely mad. You're going to drive 36 hours, you're going to have six hours there, and then you drive 36 hours back again with the kids in the back. Um, but, you know, they're still friends, they loved it, and so on. So I entirely agree with you that this... Uh, this behaviour is there, but if you if if you move away from that type of demand, and after all, they only did it once, and they could have they could have rented a, a, a car to do it if they wanted to. Most trips that people make are around town, and particularly if you look at most if if you look at the uh, the, the lorry market, the truck market, then what you what you see is that most of those go on a pretty predictable route every day and uh, they go you know, they go, they do deliveries around downtown deliveries around the suburbs and so on they know how many miles they're going to do they go back in the depot they can plug in and they're recharged again for the morning similarly if you're doing the long haul uh truck today you want to go from um, lo- lo- deliver uh, chinese goods from lo- from uh, los-, los angeles port into New York City, you know, the haulier does that trip. He knows exactly uh, how long it takes. He knows how, how far it is, and you can set up charging networks for them. So I think that what you'll see and what you are starting to see is segmented uh, demand here. This is the thing about demand. It's not one size fits all, but, um, you know, sort of you, you've got local deliveries that will go electric pretty quickly. People who are primarily going out shopping, doing the school run, all those things, driving to work, they know what they're doing. Again, the cost and the, the affordability of this, plus you know, it's, they're, they're nice cars, uh, you know, that will drive it forward. Uh, and then, yes, there'll always be uh, the people who were worried that I might go and need to see great, great uncle Arthur if, if he became ill, and that would mean driving from one end of the country to the other, so I don't want to do it, and I don't want to rent. Okay, fine. Not everybody does it at once. And that's what we're seeing in Europe, and that's what we're seeing in China. Um, but you, you see, you know, if, you, if you look at a product life cycle kind of chart, what you see is you get the early adopters, then you get the early majority, then the late majority, and the skeptics. And what you're talking about there, Max, is the skeptics who say, well, I might want to drive 2,000 miles, so I'm not going to do it. Okay, fine. Nobody's forcing you to. Yeah. That it almost makes me think of like an electric Route 66, you know, with, with towns popping up along these new routes where people have made that bet on on a future uh, with electric vehicles, and that you will need charging, and that that could change 
that could change travel routes across the country, and thus you could see uh, towns pop up. You know, I'm thinking of it in the in the towns dying along Route 66 as the highways came in. But uh, you know, the highways are not set up with with charging of electric vehicles in mind. That, so that that could be an interesting uh, little side side bet there. I mean, one of the things to say, you get lots of different business models and they may or may not work. One of the things that's, that's going on in China um, is that service stations are being changed so that they, instead of going in to buy gas, uh, you swap over your battery. So you go in, you pay the same amount of money, it takes the same time, you just leave, leave the old battery there and you put in the new one. Yeah. Whether that catches on or not, I don't know, but it, it, it's, it's happening. Yeah. All right. So we got some more questions I want to get to. Um, Ian just asked, uh, what are Paul's views on the best way to play the move to electric cars? And he caveats that by saying, besides Tesla. Well, yeah, I wouldn't go near Tesla. Uh, <laughs> I mean, te Tesla is one of those great, uh, uh, great momentum stocks that tells you when there's a bubble going on, what you want, ideally, uh, to tell you about the bubble is a stock that has no earnings and no prospect of earnings because you can then put your own imagination to work as to what might happen. So if you want to be a Tesla supporter, you could say, yes, it's going to sell all the electric cars in the world and it's going to do um, all the automated um, self-driving cars and it's going to do this and it's going to take over the lorries and so on and so forth. And I go, yeah, fine. And if everybody is believing that and you're in a big bubble, the price will go to the moon, and when the price starts to come down, you know the bubble is starting to end. Uh, so we, we see this a lot of times. I mean, Pets.com was a fantastic uh, version of this in uh, 1998 uh, through till it went bankrupt. And uh, I'm not sure that Tesla will go bankrupt, but it can, seems to re refinance itself at the moment, but who knows. I think the what, what I would look at is partly the, the auto companies themselves uh, who are the ones who are focused on this? Uh, GM are, are focused. Mary Barra's done quite a good job there. She gets a lot of stick, but she's done quite a good job. She, and she's focused on uh, China, and she's cut back a lot of the dross, a lot of the loss-making factories that they had. You know, if, 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 you, if you look at General Motors, it was everywhere around the world, and it's cut, cut out, dropped out of a lot of markets now. So it's much more focused. It's doing what I suggest about focusing on demand. Where you know, there is demand, can we access that demand profitably? And they seem to have a good position in in China. So I think that would that could work uh, quite nicely. Um, if you look in uh, in Europe, uh, VW are are doing very well. They've got the ID.3 range. And the great thing about GM and VW is they know how to make cars and they know how to sell them. And you know, it, 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 we are still selling cars with autos. We're not trying to do something different. So um, having that core experience uh, is an advantage. Other companies have missed out on the boat and, and will disappear, obviously. Then, of course, there's all the parts suppliers to it. So uh, there's a big issue around batteries and how how, how you know good the batteries can be in terms of charge life and so on and there's you know if you, if you do some research on that there are interesting battery companies but also parts one of the things about an electric vehicle is that it has very few moving parts so the average internal combustion engine car that uses gasoline or diesel um, has about 2,000 moving parts the electric vehicles have about 20. So there's quite an opportunity for tier two and tier three auto suppliers to really dramatically gain market share because the people who are currently supplying won't be supplying in the future. Everybody's got to shift over. And um, you know, plastics companies supplying in that area, if they put the effort in and work with Detroit and uh, with Wolfsburg and so on, you, know, you, know, you want to lightweight, the battery's quite heavy. So if you can move, use more plastic than steel, uh, then you, you know, companies will do that as long as safety isn't compromised. So there's, there's quite a few ways of playing that one. Okay. Yeah, I just saw an interesting one that was in Norway, which is an important EV market because mm. of the percentage of cars there, which are sold. I believe it's over 50% of, mm. of cars sold in the market are electric vehicles. Uh, that Volkswagen model that you mentioned actually just surpassed the Tesla Model 3 for sales uh, even in, in 2020, even though 
uh, it hasn't even been on the market for all of 2020 like the Model 3. Um, so some of that trend you're talking about with Volkswagen already starting to, to play out in the data in those sort of more uh, mature electric vehicle markets. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, you know, if I look at Tesla, you know, it, it, it decided to try and sell cars online and it didn't go through the normal dealer network. Well, to be honest, if I'm spending 20, 30,000 bucks on a new car, I'd like to know there was a dealer around in case it goes wrong. I wouldn't want to have to be tweeting to uh, Elon Musk and saying, can you pick me up, please, on Highway 66? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I'm with you there. Well, you know, I'm in, I'm in New York, and my favorite thing is is not owning a car and yes. not having to drive and never worrying about whether I should have that third pint or uh, mm. and, or not. Um, I, the subway doesn't care how how many I've had. Um, <laughs> But we, we got a couple of questions here from Sudipto, uh, who who wants to know about two different industries. So one is, uh, we'll start here, which, what's your view on pharma, um, and do you see it potentially as a way to play this aging population? Um, is there any merit to investing in bulk API manufacturers? Um, very good idea, and, and yes, absolutely. One of the startling things that's happened uh, this year has been that um, you know, in the states, in Europe, and so on, around eighty or so percent of all medicines are generic medicines, and that's all been outsourced to uh, to China makes the APIs, and India then manufactures them. So this is Rambaxi and uh, Teva and, and in Israel and so on, and, uh, and what you found was that those supply chains proved very very uh, fragile. To give an example, uh, in the UK, uh, the UK was within a few days in February of running out of paracetamol. I mean, can you imagine that? Uh, that it, because India had put paracetamol on the banned export list, and the UK government had to go to the Indian government and say, "Excuse me, uh, you know, could we please have an allocation of paracetamol because otherwise we won't have any." Now. Clearly, everybody is now starting to reshore that production. The, the, uh, the you know, Congress, uh, you know, maybe people don't get realize, Congress has already allocated about 850 million bucks to starting this process off. Um, you know, so the, uh, the, the, the lawmakers are on this, and it is starting to happen. It's the same as happening in Europe, same as um, you know, we'll start elsewhere. So, yes, I think there's going to be uh, quite a change. And this is one of our big paradigm shifts, that you're not only going to be uh, working on reshoring because supply chains are proved so, uh, so fragile and vulnerable, but you're also going to do it with new technology. Uh, so you're going to be looking at advanced manufacturing, because generally speaking, for example, with pharma, you're going to be making relatively small quantities. Uh, you know, you're making thousands of pounds rather than millions of pounds every day. And we're still using, well, we have been still using technology third tank reactors as we would have done, you know, when the uh, when the Civil War was going on. So uh, clearly a major opportunity to move over to uh, uh, automated, uh, bio-enabled, continuous uh, manufacturing. Uh, for crystallization, for reactions, and so on, which will actually be much cheaper, is the interesting thing, uh, much cheaper and much more flexible. I could see, for example, that you will be able to start manufacturing drugs on a much more local basis, because it doesn't make an awful lot of sense to manufacture them all in, uh, uh, up in, uh, in, in Pennsylvania and then fly them out around the states. Why not? If you want to make them, why not make them in Los Angeles? Why not make them in Houston? And you're going to be able to do that much more cheaply. Mm -hmm. And do you think that this will be something that will uh, flow down to established players, or will we see new companies entering the market? Do the the big pharma companies have the um, the know how to to do this new manufacturing, or will we see maybe manufacturing firms moving into pharmaceuticals? Well, I, I think that one of the things you, when we look at individual industries. Uh, one of the things we know is that in pharma, uh, there are some very tight regulations for very good reason. So, you know, if, if, I, if I want to make orange juice, 
yes, there are regulations, but most people will probably be able to make orange juice. Uh, if you start saying, you know, can you make paracetamol, uh, there's going to be some pretty strict uh, questions asked. Um, and it will take some time to prove that I can do that safely and that I'm not introducing. You know, the, the, the problem with pharmaceuticals is I'm not intro introducing uh, contaminants in the manufacturing process. This thing called good manufacturing pr practice, for example, uh, is very important. So I think that the pharma companies, established pharma companies, will uh, will still be there and will still do the bulk of this. But what they are going to be doing, and I'm sorry, I've uh, given the question, so I'll answer it. I mean, I'm I'm chairman of a uh, a company in uh, in Scotland, uh, Netec, which is manufacturing uh, modern, uh, very you know, very sophisticated but very cheap. Uh, crystallization and reaction technology and we are seeing a lot of demand now from the pharma industry for our uh, for, for our product so and I'm sure there are other companies around like that so I think some of the technology suppliers might be a good way to play it because obviously technology suppliers have to be able to technology has to work but they don't have to be responsible for making sure that it actually is manufactured safely yeah, and you talked about that eight hundred and fifty million dollars from the government. Uh, pharma obviously having well entrenched themselves into the political machine here in the United States and having strong lobbyists. Uh, it seems hard to believe that uh, the established players wouldn't take home uh, a bulk of that eight hundred and fifty million dollars. Um, and probably, depending upon who who gets elected and, and what we see happening in the next few weeks, uh, who who knows how big that eight hundred and fifty million dollar number could get. Yes. Um, Sudipto had another question about a, about a different market um, in the energy sector. Um, what's your view on, on natural gas? Do you see the potential for a price correction? Uh, well, I think that we were talking earlier around what's happened in the shale patch. And the shale patch was a, was a great bubble where you just invested because you knew you were going to make money. You didn't have to think about how you were going to make money. And I've noticed that in recent months, investors have started to worry a bit about, well, how are we going to make money? Because we seem to be pouring it into a bottomless pit here. And uh, certainly the, you know, some of the dire predictions for uh, production have disappeared. Uh, but I wouldn't be surprised, to be honest, to start to see that gas prices moving up a bit more, you know, with corrections and so on, on the way. Um, because uh, the, you know, the, the gas, we've had a gas bubble for a very long time, which has kept prices very low. And you know, if we have a hard winter, for example, if we have a cold winter, then that will start to drain gas inventory. And if we then start to see, you know, people turn on their air con uh, in the summer, uh, you could, I'm not, I'm not anticipating a, you know, a, a, a sudden, sudden jump, but I'm just thinking that gas seems to have come off the bottom and I suspect will, will trend higher over the next few years in the States, even while the global price trends lower. Um, and this is, you know, if you look at what's happened, people have overexpanded in LNG, liquefied natural gas. Uh, so there's an awful lot of that around. And once you've put in the terminals, then you know, you, you've spent a few billion dollars, so you might as well use it. The actual, you know, if, you, if you don't make any money using it, it doesn't matter. But if you make some money actually on the throughput, uh, you'll take that and try and pay the interest bill and stay alive. Um, so I think the LNG market uh, and, glo and the global gas market will will remain weak uh, in line with oil prices. I think oil prices are, are overcooked at the moment. Uh, but uh, I think in the States, uh, it might be a slightly different story. Okay. All right. Well, we're getting to the end here, Paul. I want to give you just a few minutes to summarize what you've, what you've said here today and leave viewers with the important takeaways that you think they should have. Uh, you know, just just a minute or two. Yeah, sure. Well, thanks very much, Max. And uh, great questions as always. And thanks for the audience as well. This has been very good to have audience questions live. And the two real things. Uh, one is I want to re-emphasize the fact that I don't believe we're going back to where we were at the beginning of the year, and the, 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 the pandemic has accelerated these pandemic shifts. Uh, if, if you want to go and have a look on our website, as I say, it's, it's easy to remember, new-normal.com, we flesh out a bit more about the, uh, the paradigm shifts and what they mean. And, and of course, as you know, as you said, we, we have introduced 
uh, where we're working with uh, Real Vision, which we're delighted to do, this new uh, weekly new normal insight. And so if you'd like to go to that, the new normal.com and sign up to uh, to get three months uh, weekly copies for free of, uh, of insight, uh, please do that. Yeah, yeah, I did. I did want to mention that that there is a in in addition going out today. Uh, Paul is giving us a biweekly one to publish on Real Vision, um, but you can get it weekly for free for right now as it is in front of the paywall. But uh, what is your date that you're actually going to uh, pull the rug out from under everybody and and they're going to have to they're going to have to pay for it? Well, we thought probably the end of the year. So, Paul. Thank you so much for for joining us. Thank you for all the reports for the Real Vision subscribers, and, and I look forward to doing it again soon. Thanks very much, Max. Thank you for watching this interview. This is just a taste of what we do at Real Vision. To learn more about the complex world of finance, business, and the global economy, click on the membership link in the description. Give us seven days to change your life. This will be the best dollar you ever invest.